Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. So I have been doing some incredible amounts of research this weekend, and I stumbled across something that I think you are going to find absolutely fascinating. And I think it gives us tremendous insight as to what the government's plan, what their game plan will be for inflation and price controls for the rest of this decade, for the rest of the 2020s. So let's get right into this report from the Federal Reserve themselves. And again, when I stumbled across this article from this weekend, I, I was, well, you can tell I geek out on this stuff because I was like super excited. <laughs> so what am I referring to? This is the 32nd annual report of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System from 2023. Oh, no. <laughs> from 1945 that is correct covering operations for the year 1945 now you guys know from watching my videos and i'm sure most of you watch uh, lynn's content or read her blog and uh, she has been talking about how she thinks this decade will be the 1940s all over again i completely completely agree when you listen to her arguments i mean they're rock solid rock solid and uh, so, therefore, you know, I've said on this channel that that's kind of my base case as well, that uh, we don't really see the 1970s. We see the 1940s. And even if we do see the 1970s, that inflation never goes up in a straight line. It never goes from two to five to nine to 20 to 40 to 50. It's always uh, a roller coaster ride, really. But I think there's tremendous value in looking at what they did, what the central planners did in the 1940s. Because I think that's most likely going to be the government's playbook for the rest of the 2020s. Because the reason they got their inflation uh, in the 1940s, the reason that was an in, one of the main reasons that was an inflationary decade, is because they really created the almost the exact same type, that the variables were very, very similar to the variables we saw that produced significant consumer price inflation in uh, 2020, 2021. So let's go through this really. I'm just going to, obviously, there's, what, 140 pages here. Uh, I'm not going to go through that all, but I am just going to go through quickly the first couple pages here. The first thing that I wanted to discuss is, uh, let's see, I'm going to find out effects country bank situation outline general terms. Okay, so between 1930, excuse me, between June 30, 1940, on the eve of the defense program in the end of 1945, the government raised approximately $380 billion. Of this, $153 came from taxes. $153 billion came from taxes. Okay? So why is that important? Because when we're trying to figure out inflation, we've got to consider what's happening to the amount of currency in circulation. And in circulation is very, very key because just the overall amount of currency, that that may or may not lead or contribute to consumer price inflation. So when they are raising, when the government is raising money by just taxes, well, what they're doing is they're not really increasing the supply. Now, I would argue that if we really want to get nuanced, which we should, that they would be taking savings and turning them into checking. So they would be taking money supply that currently wasn't in, in circulation and putting it into circulation. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Let's stay focused on this specific article from the Fed in 1945. So they go on to say this was about 40%. The remainder, $228 billion, or the remainder that they did not raise from taxes, was about 60%. And that was raised by borrowing, you would imagine, by increasing the public debt. Of the total borrowed, $133 billion, or about 60% of the borrowing, came from selling government securities to investors other than commercial banks and Federal Reserve banks. And we're gonna go by, we're gonna go over why this is such an important distinction in just a moment. Approximately $95 billion or 40% of the borrowing was raised by selling government securities to the commercial banking system. Okay. It is important to any appraisal of monetary and credit conditions to understand that borrowing from the banking system, whether by the government or others, creates an equivalent addition to the country's monetary supply. Let me 
me read that again for you. It is important to any appraisal of the monetary and credit conditions to understand that borrowing from the banking system, whether by the government or by others, creates equivalent addition in the country's monetary supply. What we always talk about is M2 money supply. But what they're saying here is something that I say, so I'm absolutely blue in my face <laughs> on these videos and especially the whiteboard videos. When a bank lends or buys from a non-bank, including the government, whether it's the Fed or not, it's going to impact, it's going to increase the overall money supply. Now, again, is that circulation or not? That's another rabbit hole. But that's what we're looking at, the broad aggregate. It's going to increase. If a non-bank lends or buys to another non-bank, then it doesn't increase it. So why does this happen? Because when a bank is buying something or lending money, they're creating new currency units. Those currency units did not exist before. They did not exist. Now, what's interesting is most people assume, or when I say they create currency units, they think of that as creating green pieces of paper. In other words, that once they create this supply of money, it's just out there and it's circulating for forever. Where... That's not necessarily true because when a bank creates money by lending it into existence or buying something, a security, an asset from a non-bank entity, then what they're doing is they're creating currency, but that currency needs to be paid back. And when the currency is paid back, it's destroyed. Where if you give someone dollars, if that bank were to have print banknotes and then the person pays back those banknotes, those banknotes are not destroyed. So the amount of money supply just goes up. But theoretically, with the banks lending it into existence, especially for, for productive purposes, they get paid back, then the money's gone. You just imagine if you got a home loan for $500,000 today and then paid it back tomorrow. Today, the money supply would increase by 500 grand. So that's in your checking account balance. Tomorrow, it would decrease because you pay the bank back, back and those dollars disappear. Where if, if they would have given you 500,000 banknotes or green pieces of paper or gold coins, you pay back those gold coins, and now the bank has them as an asset on their balance sheet, and they're going to continue to circulate. You can't destroy those. So that is a crucial, crucial, crucial difference that we have to get our head around. So now let's get back to what they're saying here. Borrowing for individuals, businesses, concerns, insurance companies, or other sources except the banking system represents the investment of existing savings. So really, in other words, taking savings turning it into checking, which doesn't increase because you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're taking money from over here and putting it over there. So you're not really impacting the aggregate total. To the extent that the government did not finance its war program by taxation, it was obliged to borrow. And to the extent that it did not borrow from non-bank investors, it relied upon banks and thus created new supplies of money the banks did okay so now this goes on to a completely separate talking point or separate video on how the fed's balance sheet impacted this and to the extent that it did but i'm gonna i'm gonna try to stay focused here i'm gonna save that for a completely separate video so let's go on to say or read and basically what they in the next paragraph, they they tell they uh, give the exact numbers as far as how much the money supply increased, and then they go on to say that uh, this has this could likely produce massive inflationary pressure. So right here, they say all of these items compose an inflationary potential at the time when the supplies of goods and services available for purchase with existing funds and currently produced income is far from adequate to meet current demand. Okay, so simple. They're saying because of this process of the banking system, there was way more currency units that were created in circulation, not just in aggregate total. And because of this this, you know, the war that they're in, they weren't creating as many goods and services for the consumer to buy. And therefore, this is going to create inflationary pressure. What did they do in 2020? Literally the exact same thing. Exact same thing they did here in the 1940s. So 
<clears throat> then they go on to say, uh, ba -ba 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 the bottom, I'm trying to find it here. And this is a little, I, I should have highlighted this, but my highlighter tool does not work. Bottom line, they say that in order to squash this inflationary pressure, they've got to come out with targeted, smart, intelligent price controls. That's really the main takeaway here. Let me see if I can find it in this. Uh... Oh, here we go. The government has, in fact, been reversing its creation of money by drawing down its surplus. So what they did initially is they tried two ways to attack this uh, inflationary pressure that they themselves created, of course. Uh, number one was price controls. Number two, to try to create a surplus for the government. So when the, sur uh, the government has a surplus, now they're taxing more than they spend. And so they take that tax money that's in addition to what they're, this is how it works in theory, that tax money in, above and beyond what they're spending, and they take that money and pay down existing debt. They pay off T-bills. And when they pay off those T-bills, what that is doing is that is decreasing the amount of currency in circulation. The objective, obviously, is to decrease it by the amount that you increased it. Now, I don't, I don't know for a fact. I would be very surprised if they are able, ever able to actually decrease. In fact, I, I do know this because I looked at the M2 money supply in uh, 1940s, and it definitely went up significantly. So uh, they were not successful in bringing the money supply back down by running these surpluses by keeping taxes elevated. But they were um, able to create these price controls, right? So again, let's remember the way they attacked this, higher taxes and price controls, okay? So my opinion, and this is why, there's another reason why it's my base case, is we're just gonna see this same thing all over again, right? Because they created inflation or consumer price inflation the exact same way that they did in the 1940s. So I think that there, now to be clear, I don't think that inflation goes up in a straight line. Most of you guys understand my base case is that the 19 or the 2020s are, are an inflationary decade, but we don't have constant inflation just going up. Um, I, you know, I've been talking about disinflation on this video for, or this channel for a long, long time, about maybe six months or so, if not more. And uh, right now, I, I think, you know, we've gone from 9.1 all the way down to three. Uh, that's pretty much what I expected. You know, do we go to two? Eh, I don't know, because I think we'll probably have around the same thing we've seen for the last year until something significant changes. So I would not be surprised to hover right around 2.53% until uh, we get one of two things. The next wave of a disinflationary pressure, deflationary pressure, such as a black swan event, uh, a financial crisis, uh, maybe the next wave of the, the banking system collapsing, you know, the credit contraction, uh, that that is not good for prices. That puts a downward that's uh, downward pressure on prices. But then the question becomes, what's the government's response going to be? Right. Uh, that's the the trillion dollar question. So most likely they're going to respond with more than what they did in 2020, and that takes you to that next wave of inflationary pressure. And when we get that next wave of inflationary pressure, I think these are going to be main talking points: increasing taxes uh, to to you know they're going to say to redistribute and blah 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 blah. And they're going to blame all the greedy capitalists for the inflationary pressures because we know that's the only reason prices are going up. And that's how they're going to argue in favor of price controls. So, you know, why do we want to focus on this Phillips curve? Why do we want to increase the unemployment rate when that just hurts the poor and middle class? We can just keep the unemployment rate super low by keeping interest rates incredibly low. And then we don't have to worry about inflation because we just have price controls. And then we're just going to keep taxes extremely high to redistribute and try to run a surplus to draw down the amount of, you know, currency units that we're increasing by doing something like UBI, as an example. And uh, I just thought it was fascinating to see this game plan executed in real life. We, we don't have to speculate on, you know, how it would look in the future. Just take the DeLorean right back to 1945 and just read 
just read from their own words exactly what they did and why they did it. And then I think you see that the probability of that happening again is extremely high. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. See you in the next video.